start the recording. Yep. Today's presentation is part of the Culture Builds Communities webinar series. This community-based project is designed to help Native communities plan and develop cultural facilities. Culture Builds Communities is a project of the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Major funding is provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the National Museum of the American Indian. Thank you so much for being here today. All right, um, my name is Janet Smoke. I am the director of the Suquamish Museum in Suquamish, Washington, which is just across the Puget Sound from Seattle, for those of you who are familiar with the Pacific Northwest. And I have a, a slide, a PowerPoint slideshow today that has 22 slides. So I, I tried to put the most important stuff up top just in case I talk too long. So we'll see how we do through this, through these slides. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background about me and those who are joining us from Suquamish, whose names I see in our audience now. Um, I've been in the museum field since about 1982 as an intern. And those, that first decade was a little bit off and on. But essentially, I settled into a curatorial track, um, first at the Utah State Historical Society. And eventually, when a, um, a museum in Michigan, I became a director in 2006. I hired here at the Suquamish Museum in May of 2011. And that was about two weeks before Suquamish broke ground to build this new museum facility. The museum itself here in Suquamish opened to the public in 1983 after a couple of years worth of an oral history project, photograph um, and manuscript, manuscript gathering projects. And so they've been here a very long time, but this facility is not quite yet 10 years old. Now we have a staff of nine people here at the museum. Five of those nine are Suquamish tribal members. Two of them are other tribal members, and then two of us are non-tribal members. So it's a rather small staff, and but it's very focused on um, our Suquamish tribal community. Now, as we go through to the question and answer um, period, I'll introduce a lot of our staff members on, on the call or ask them to speak up, and also those who are um, from Suquamish here. Now I started with this slide just as an introduction slide because it gave a good little snapshot of, of sort of a 10 year history. We're slanted here towards the latter half of that history, but overall, if you're looking at the, at the image from the upper left-hand side, you'll see Suquamish Museum, an advertisement that actually appeared in SeaTac Airport. And of course, SeaTac is our primary tourism thoroughfare we do get, of course, driving um, people who are driving through the area, but if it's a destination that they're coming to in the Seattle area, they're coming through SeaTac. And the Port of Seattle, who is the governing authority of SeaTac, actually uh, provided us grant funding to have this ad um, done professionally and then installed in SeaTac Airport. So a lot of the opportunities we've been able to do of this scale have been funded through grant opportunity. Now that top middle picture is a relief carving panel that was done by a Suquamish tribal elder, Randy Purser. And she did the carving and it was installed on the MV Suquamish, which is, if you're familiar with the Seattle area, we have ferry boats that travel between um, Seattle and the Kitsap side of, of the water. And the ferry commission built a new boat and the name was chosen to honor the Suquamish tribe. And that relief panel has, has been installed inside the ferry boat along with about, I think overall there were 13 different pieces of artwork by Suquamish tribal members that were installed in the ferry along with information about Suquamish culture and history. And then on the right hand side, the tall picture is the is one of our banners, which we put on the most public facing end of our building. And so anybody who drives by, that's what they see, loud and proud. And that's a picture of Eddie Carrier 
um, standing next to a fish trap, a weir um, that's actually uh, mounted here in our exhibit. But Eddie Carrier is a master basket maker and he has also been working with archeologists over the past 20 odd years, looking at ancient wet site basket fragments and then recreating them, what they would look like if, if they were woven again in the modern time. So when you, you know, you bring a basket fragment out of the ground and it is a flat piece of fiber, but Eddie can look at that flat basket and he can recreate it as a 3D object again. And joining him here are, are individuals from Musqueam and the University in British Columbia and his anthropologist friend here, Dale. Um, and it was a really incredible visit or exhibit that we had detailing the kind of work he does in recreating um, basket fragments from archaeological sites. Now this middle bottom shows a, um, one of our international tours. We still have a fair number of people who come from an international um, destination. This is the Peace Boat, which originates in, in Japan and travels all over the world. Uh, when you look at our, our visitor log in a typical summer, certainly not this summer, it's like a you know, worldwide who's who from all the different countries that people tend to find us from. And a lot of that is because people will seek out um, the Chief Seattle's gravesite. Chief Seattle as a um, environmental leader has been adopted as an environmental leader in the modern era. And then this last image here on the bottom left is a photograph of Robin um, Saigo, who at the time of groundbreaking, because this is a photo at the groundbreaking, was the museum board president. Marilyn Jones, who oversaw the museum, she was the director before I am for 30 odd years. Much of what you see in this new building was the realization of a many decade long dream for her. And then Leonard Forsman, also a former director of the Suquamish Museum, who is also now the president of the museum board and of course chairman of the Suquamish tribe. So I thought it would, uh, was a lovely way just to introduce you to the facility. Um, and as we go along, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and um, you know, I'll, I'll answer sort of as we, as we go along. Um, and I can't really start the story of the new facility without giving a quick introduction to what is essentially the old facility. Uh, the original tribal museum was built into a converted attic space in the original tribal administration building. And it was overall about 3000 square foot of nooks and crannies in narrow rooms. Um, this was the heart of the museum when it opened. And, in, and as you can tell, this space here, the wideness of it is that canoe now is in the middle of that space and that's a small canoe. So it was a very sort of small meandering space that they converted into the museum, but it was incredibly well done. And the programming um, and the exhibits at the time were of course state of the art. And in those early days, they had an amazing amount of tourism and visitation. But by the early 2000s, things were changing, not only in Suquamish, um, but also in the museum field. So by 2009, 2010, the facility was down to about 3,000 visitors a year. Um, tribal administration had since moved out of the building into another location a few miles away. And a nearby tourist attraction to the old museum had also, for the most part, shut down. Um, but from the beginning, when they installed that space, they always had the idea of wanting something bigger and something to house Suquamish collections. Because the point of the museum, the point of this program has always been to preserve Suquamish cultural artifacts and information in history. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea of what, of what the old museum started from in the 1983. All right, now I need to get it to advance here somehow. There we go. This is the new facility. So this was the dream come true. 
these photos that you're seeing sort of in a collage formation here were taken just before we opened in September of 2012 by an architectural photographer hired by the architect named Ben Ben Schneider. Um, I have used these photographs like you have not believed over the, these last years. Um, but we learned a few lessons after we opened this museum and as beautiful it is as it is and as proud of it as we are, some of those early predictions of what would happen next, some came true and others did not. So it's just, I wanted to give you kind of a, a overview of what that thought was on the eve of opening of what would happen next. And what we did is what most people, most institutions do is we had commissioned a business plan um, to be a, you know, to predict what could we expect over the next one to three years. And some of that was pretty accurate and most of it was absolute fiction. Um, none of it came even close to being true. Um, I think the, the first thing that was the biggest disappointment was that they had predicted from the outset that we would have about 15,000 a year attendance in those first three years and we would grow from there. By 2019, our best year yet, we just topped 13,000 people. Now, the other thing they predicted, of course, was that our income per year, that we would have about 180,000 of earned income every year. In our best years, we've had about 150 to 160. So they're not that far off in that respect. Um, but they also assumed our operating budget would remain around $400,000 a year, which was just about where it was when we opened. Now that was not true from the get-go. Um, but remember kind of those expectations as we go on through as I introduce more numbers. But they base these numbers by comparing us to tribal museums in San Diego, Santa Fe, and two in Oklahoma, the Shawnee and the Cherokee at that time, with budgets ranging from $200,000 to 1.5 million and having six to 26 staff members, depending on the size of that institution and in facilities that range from 3,000 square feet to 36,000 square feet. Now our facility is around 9,000 square feet. So it was, it's hard back then, especially when there were fewer tribal museums to get an accurate picture of what your business would be. However, at the same time, they anticipated that being next door to Seattle meant we were going to be a benefit of everything Seattle had to offer. And in reality, we may be not very far as the crow flies from Seattle, but we are a transportation journey from Seattle. Um, so it, that assumption was what I think skewed their predictions more than any other factor. But it's worth pushing back on a business plan author. If you see things like this that you know from experience may or may not be true. All right, so um, sort of the bolts and nuts of how this happened. Um, in the early 2000s, Suquamish embarked on a $20 million capital campaign project in order to build five different community facilities across the reservation. Now, the new museum was going to be one of those very first projects scheduled for 2009. And by 2006, our architectural site plan had been developed. An exhibit, exhibit developer was on board, site was chosen, but the canoe journey intervened. And if you know the Pacific Northwest canoe journey, uh, every year a different tribal um, host uh, invites the journey to end and have protocol at their, at their reservation site. And Suquamish chose to host the 2009 canoe journey which meant all of a sudden the infrastructure to host that journey took precedence over the museum. And the House of Awakened Culture down on the waterfront, also a longhouse style, was built first. But the same architects built both. So the longhouse style down on the waterfront, designed with, by Methune, became the basic bones of the structure that now is the museum. And of course there were major differences in design and what ended up being inside each facility and how each facility was, was you know, the nuts and bolts of them, so to speak. But essentially Methune then became the builder 
and Suquamish for those two major institutions. Now, nearly 10 years after the campaign launched, the museum project began in earnest in sort of mid-2010. Um, and I wanted to show you just kind of the original dream. When you look at the longhouse structure that you'll see very familiar structure there, these two structures that were to be built on the grounds have not yet come to fruition. One of those lessons learned that sometimes the dream doesn't arrive, you know, all together and in place on year one. And it can take many, many years to, to make it all happen, even once you're on site. Um, now, but Methune, as I said, designed here in the House of American Culture. Both are longhouse inspired designs and Methune actually won a regional award on the Suquamish Museum design. Uh, the site chosen at the corner of Suquamish Way and Division is across the street from the current Suquamish Tribal Admin Center in the very visible site in the heart of Suquamish. And that was really important because I said part of the decline of the old location had been that separation from the primary business that is the, um, the tribal administration. Now, the, what you see surrounding um, the museum building, which is right here, you see lot one, lot four, lot, lot five. This is the, a housing development that was leased to a developer 20 odd years ago or more. And it was scheduled to come back to the tribe and did come back to the tribe in 2019 when that lease was up. So while at this time when the museum was built, there was houses on each of these lots. Now these, this has been totally cleared except for lot four. Um, and a Suquamish public park, a community park has actually been built in the space that leads off to the right of this map. And lot four, the house remains and it is now the um, Lushootse language house um, for the public um, language learning here in Suquamish, who have developed into an absolutely wonderful partner, not to mention um, the leader of that program is on my museum board. Um, but you can see the site in and how this was the as built survey in 2012. Now, the construction timeline, just going to kind of go through nuts and bolts here. Um, the groundbreaking on the site, as I said, was mid May 2011. The site prep, the hardscape, the parking areas had already been leveled and everything prepared. Um, the final phases of the build and landscaping happened between February and September of 2012. And we moved from the old facility into the new facility in August of 2012. And then of course we opened in September of 2012. And the only two images I have in the museum in, in my folders were these two of the actual build. Uh, so it is it was a timber frame construction inside with a concrete um, floor. So back at this um, image of what they thought this place would look like in the beginning. Um, and I just sort of wanted to go through some basics. It was a seven and a half million total cost. That was from the land to the top of the built roof. Um, it's a 9,000 square foot facility. It's 192 foot long and 45 feet wide typical longhouse design. The storage space is 900 square feet. Um, but when you see that room, we have compact shelving. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of real estate in that 900 square feet. The workspace for collections is 685 square feet. Research space, we have a dedicated research room that's 250 square foot. Our permanent gallery is about 2000 square feet and the rotating gallery is 1,000 square feet. So when you're looking at this, this is the gallery space right here along the tall end of the facility. Number eight is our collection storage. Um, our education room, which is up at the front right here is 700 square feet. The retail store next to it is um, 500 square feet. And the staff offices, which are essentially 10 and 11 here is 450 square feet. So when you think about it, we, there's a lot packed into not, not that many square feet. We're a very um, compact institution. The one thing I will call out though, um, in longhouse design in, in particular, but also site planning, 
if you start walking, even in a handicapped space right here next to the, the parking lot, all the way up here to our front door, you've walked the length of a football field. So it is an incredibly long approach. The single most often heard complaint, especially that first year we opened, was how long it took to walk up to the front door. Even if you walk from here down through the grounds, it's on a slope. It's about half the distance, but it is a grade, so it's a slope. So um, sometimes when you're planning facilities, it's the odd little things that end up making or breaking visitor comfort. But originally, when they first started talking about this site plan, as you can see, there's the shadow of the house that existed there. This landowner would not vacate their lease early. The museum was supposed to have been turned 90 degrees and, whoops, sorry about that. I went forward a slide there somehow. It was supposed to be turned, and should we move my mouse back here, and be this direction. So if that was the case, it would have been a really short walk from the parking lot. So this is one of those instances where they thought about it to begin with, but then when conditions changed, they didn't have a plan B. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right, now, would, could, should truisms. You know, the moment you build a facility, you start the woulda, coulda, shoulda um, rounds. The one thing I can say for certain is that there is never enough space. It doesn't matter if you're a 9,000 square foot facility or a 36,000 square foot facility, you always need more space. Um, and that's where that why is the most important question. Why do you want this facility? What do you need it for? That how is the second most important question. How are you gonna use it? Um, and I think they did a pretty good job considering, as I just said, we're 9,000 square feet in answering those two questions when they were building this facility. Now, again, they had had at that point almost 30 years of, of occupation in a different facility. Um, so, so they did have a head start on that. Um, the one thing that they didn't think of so much though is that admin, administration and staff need space too. This facility was heavily built around exhibits and collection storage with very little thought given to how staff and administration would then exist within the building. We scaled up from the old facility as a part is a more so than we did for the design for the new facility. Um, and you need to work in the planning, the kind of back of the house storage ideas. You need admin paperwork storage. You need retail merchandise storage. You need storage for all those public programming bits like chairs and tables. Um, now, of course, the Suquamish tribe chose to build what they could afford with, with the hope that we would be comfortable in this facility for a decade or more, where in reality, within five years, we were ready for more space for everything, more collection storage, more exhibit space, more education space, more retail space, everything. And that stays true to, into today. Um, and I think it's on the next door. Well, yeah, next couple. So our, like I said, our reason for being, the single most important thing here is to preserve and care for Suquamish cultural heritage and information. And our collections range from archeological, historic and modern. We have paper collections estimating about 10,000 images, 400 plus manuscripts. We have a large AV collection um, of audio and video um, and original productions. So there's a fair amount of collections that they thought was adequate for the new space. But the one thing they didn't um, count on was the fact that the moment this facility was built, all the archeological collections that were housed in other museums, especially that in the Burke Museum, um, came home. So from the about third year in, we were full in our collection storage space. And not only did the collections come home, but Suquamish tribal members who knew we were totally bursting at the seams in the old museum had been waiting for this new facility. So not only did we get a lot of archeological collections back from other museums, we also then got an absolute avalanche of items from Suquamish tribal members, at least from the perspective of the museum history. 
Now this is our storage area. Um, it's what we call the million dollar room. Um, and it was funded specifically by a Washington State Capital Heritage Grant. And even that small square foot space, you can see what I mean when I say we have a lot of, of space within that space. This movable shelving storage, and you can tell that there's a gap here at the end, there's about 60% shelves in place. That was the one nod they did to immediate growth, short-term growth, that as we filled up, whoops, I keep doing that, sorry. Um, as we filled up that space, we will, would be able to add 30% more moving shelving units. And we're at that point now where we're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna do that. There's a map case back there, there's hanging storage there for artwork. Um, but this space here, these storage racks, while they're filled, they are, from my perspective, not very good utilization of space. But that's only something you know after you occupy the space. But it really does pay when you're visiting other facilities is to really look at their storage space, see how they pack the most into the smallest spaces, get those ideas up front. This is that weir that I talked about Eddie Carrier did. This was the only space we had big enough when we were installing exhibits to store it before it hung from our ceiling in the current exhibit state, um, space. Now this is our boiler room, lessons learned. We learn more from the HVAC than any other component of this, um, this history here. HVAC design is everything. And this is our ongoing most expensive room in the facility. It is as a building more complex than any other building on the reservation. It requires specialty maintenance every single month. And I have no facilities manager. So our maintenance department, tribal maintenance department, doesn't service our building um, for an internal issue with, with government accounting. Um, and so we're, we're independent when it comes to maintenance, which has meant that we've had to contract with a laundry list of different contract specialties in order to put together um, a wraparound service for our facilities, including landscaping. Now that means that staff, and especially me, spend an inordinate amount of time dealing with the, with the inner workings, the mechanics of the building. And if I had one thing, you know, this is my primary lesson to share, is that when you build these new types of facilities and they are unique on the reservation, then know that your heaviest investment is actually going to be in the care of those facilities. Now, of course, we have a um, casino here in Suquamish, but the casino and tribal administration are completely separate here. So I could not rely on the incredibly wonderful maintenance department and HVAC specialists at our um, casino. Um, on the tribal side, we had to figure that out on our own. So that was, that's one of my lessons learned um, in this presentation. So um, that's a little bit about the building. And um, if you have any questions that are in the chat right now, I'd be happy to stop and talk just about the nuts and bolts of, of the getting the facility going. Um, but I, I don't see the chat, so I don't know if there's anything there or not. Uh, there's no questions right now. Okay, good, then I'll keep going. Um, this slide is about the exhibit design and production. So once the building was in place, while at the end of its build, we had to install an exhibit design. Um, and as I said before, that the building exhibit uh, professionals were hired in late 2006, to early 2007, to start putting an exhibit design together. Um, in the fall of 2011, we switched design firms and went with Storyline St Studio instead. Um, and the, the design, the fabrication, and the installation of our permanent exhibit here in the museum occurred in just over nine months, which sounds absolutely ridiculously crazy. Um, so I'll explain how that happened. Um, and as you, this is our museum attendance from the first full year we opened in 2013 through 2019. 
And of course, this year's attendance is going to be, you know, a fraction. Um, key lesson learned, and part of the reason why we exchange, we changed exhibit designers, because an ex the exhibit voice, once it's in the room, must be yours, not the exhibit designers. And some exhibit designers are better at presenting your voice as opposed to their voice. Um, and the other thought with that, the other key lesson that um, we learned was that don't be afraid to change course. I mean, when you think about it, you could view it as the time they spent literally three years with the other exhibit designers was wasted money. But in the end, it was not wasted money because the only way we were capable of putting an exhibit in this facility in nine months was because the tribal community had been working for three years to define what they wanted and how they wanted to express it. So I often view my job coming here late in the game as I did just a couple of weeks before groundbreaking as simply the administration part of this. I was the one that helped make that change from the old exhibit fabrication or the designers to the new designers and then work with those new designers to listen to the community's voice and to translate that voice into the exhibit as opposed to what they thought should be in that exhibit space. And that really was key. And here's a little bit about the beginning of that, the heart of the story, sharing Suquamish culture through the main exhibit. Um, they had had community meetings over three years, large and small, formal and informal. And those meetings continued throughout the nine months we were working to get it into the room. There were literally thousands of conversations. Um, there were special interest collaborations like the two photographs here on the bottom um, where we were designing the canoe sculptures. And mostly from the, from the point of view of staff and from the point of view of the exhibit designers, mostly it's just listening. I and mean, you're not talking as much as you're listening when it comes to exhibit design and trying to, to put that into an exhibit space for, for, the, for the tribal community. Um, and it's also equally important that you find partners who are good at listening to, like Storyline Studios ended up being. Um, and then Pacific Studios, another Seattle firm, ended up being our exhibit fabrication installation. Now, um, these two right here, we had hired um, the exhibit fabrication firm, hired Gloria Nussi, who is over here designing um, these, what you can see in both these photographs. These are the canoe sculptures. We knew we, knew we wanted to elevate the canoe. And I didn't, we didn't want just a, um, a bare iron you know, platform for it to sit on. So we thought we would have six figures that were just blank face mannequin type figures holding it up. But of course, our artists got involved, um, Virginia Adams, Joy Holmes, this is Marilyn Wandry, one of our board members, that's Marianne um, over here. And of course, Gloria, and there were a few others involved as well, Peg Dean, um, Kate Avakana. And they came up with these sketches. And it's from these sketches that then our sculptor sculpted the images. Now, in the midst of designing these faces, a story emerged. And so now when you see the, the canoe in the exhibit space, at the front of it, there's actually a story attached about Suquamish culture through time, with the earliest being the otter, the middle being the ancestor, and the front image being a modern canoe puller. So in this way, an organic conversation that happened in this room when the sculptor showed up became not only an important way of expressing Suquamish culture by community members, but it also then these images, when you look at Instagram or Facebook or wherever, if you see an image about from the Suquamish Museum, more than likely you're seeing these guys. They became the single most favorite feature in the building, even though they were totally unplanned from the beginning. They just happened organically. So I think that's one of the lessons we learned too, is to let go of the reins and let community not only have a voice, but to empower them to make significant contributions. 
And then this is the exhibit sort of collage as a whole. Um, now this design that they went with is not a historical society timeline. It's not an art museum, but it's sort of an amalgam between the two. But mostly the design spoke to the way that Suquamish told stories um, with images, with sound, with example. And then the time feature, timeline feature, which is along this wall right here, and as you can see, when we opened the building in September, this was the one thing that wasn't done on time. It was installed about six months after we opened. But this is the nod to the academics who want to read it. And I sometimes watch people spend 30 to 60 minutes reading this wall. It's the most unique thing I have ever in, experienced in a museum, the amount of time they will spend consuming this information. So it depends on, on what kind of a learner you are, what you're most comfortable with. But Inside the exhibit space itself, I can tell you that so much of what's embedded in this room speaks to Suquamish tribal members that any other person who sees it, any other member of the public will never see or perceive. Our first audience here is Suquamish tribal members. And they are the ones that are choosing to share then their culture with the world who choose to visit. Now the floor is a perfect example of that. Now I told you, oh, keep doing that. Sorry about that, folks. Um, it's a concrete floor, but inside this room, they didn't want it to feel industrial. They wanted it to feel natural. They chose all natural materials for this room. Um, and this floor has a ribbon running through it, which comes from Jeff Head, Dokeguats, which is the ancestral space on the Suquamish Reservation that is the least developed. Um, and there's shells and seaweed and crab, everything is embedded in this space. So it's sort of like the shoreline. Uh, when you're looking at the room, this is the forest, that's the ocean. Suquamish lived on the shoreline. And then after that, this floor. So the floor is an upended 1970s style cheap parquet method. And it mimics entirely the floor found in the old tribal center. That old tribal center that they built in 1978, 79 was the first community building that Suquamish came together to build in over a hundred years. And this was the type of floor that was in that facility. That very first weekend we opened when tribal members saw this space for the very first time, what I heard most were comments about, look at the floor because this floor is the link of who they are in this modern era. These generations who are alive today, this is their touchstone. So no member of the public would ever get that with this floor, but it speaks solely to Suquamish tribal members. Then there are a few other things embedded in this room that do that too. Now our education programs, um, the temporary exhibits and the opportunities that we've been given over the last two, 10 years, um, when I look back on it, I, I, my head kind of spins with dizziness. We normally do over 3000 school children through the museum each year. We have only ever had two to three tour guides on staff at, at any one time, which is crazy busy parts of the year. Um, and we have a difficult time managing 90 to 120 school children who arrive at one time in a space that's 2000 square feet. What we've often had to do is we break them up into three or four groups. And then we've had to look out into our community for partners that we can rotate these groups through. Um, but we've done it successfully. And I know from those numbers that, that school kids are enjoying it and that teachers are coming back. And Joey Holmes was our inaugural tour guide. He wrote the tour for the space. Um, and he works for another department now, but I still miss him. So I'll put that out there. Temporary exhibits. One of the um, criticism of that ended the the uh, old museum space was that the museums installed first in the 80s and then in the 90s never changed. That was once they were there, that was that. Um, and in this new facility, they wanted a vibrancy of rotating exhibits, temporary exhibits. Um, 
and they also wanted a space for tribal members to be able to express themselves and the ability to deep dive into components of our collections. And in the beginning, I had an ambitious thing where we were gonna have three to four exhibits a year. That has now settled into about one to two exhibits a year um, with the staff this size. And just to give a quick overview here, this map exhibit was one of our very first exhibits. It was rented from Washington State Historical Society. And we've done, tended to do this pattern where we curate an exhibit, then we have a traveling exhibit. We curate an exhibit back and forth. Um, this here is a trade exhibit that was done by a tribal elder and her husband, Betty Pasco. Um, and they did this show from design to narrative. We helped them put it in the room somewhat. But so it's allowed tribal members literally to curate their own shows. And then this is an artist piece done by Peg Dean. And her, we had a mother daughter show, Peg Dean, Kate Avakana, so tribal artists have had the rotating gallery of about 1,000 square feet to showcase their own art. We've invited um, weavers. This is um, Susan Pavel, who is from Oregon. We've invited uh, tribal members outside of the area from other tribes to exhibit in this room. And then of course, we've used the room for deep dives like the archeology span of Old Man House. And this was another traveling exhibit on traditional foods. Now our education space, our education room, which is what you're seeing here in this corner, uh, is a very small room. Uh, we set it up and do rentals. We are sort of the diplomatic space whenever we have government officials visiting in Suquamish, we tend to host lunches here. Um, but we also do programs, the walls serve as temporary exhibit space. Uh, on our lobby space, we have um, temporary artist exhibits. These are actually uh, weavings by our school children from the Suquamish school. This is a piece from Eddie Carrier. We do um, artist curated exhibits where we invite a variety of artists to, to come into that room. Uh, this is Danielle. Um, she is a Suwamish weaver of some note um, and she will come in every once in a while just to utilize the space to get a project done. This is on the, on the museum grounds. It's the story circle. This is um, Barbara Lawrence who has worked with the museum practically since its founding and is an amazing Suquamish elder. Um, but again, that's part of how we split up those school groups. But those adjacent learning spa um, spaces inside the museum and outside the museum have been critical for our education programs. So when you're designing a museum, if you don't have the space to build an education room as large as you might ever want to have it, and then start thinking of how you can use your surroundings to augment that space. So this was one of our, um, in 2017, one of our, our tribal um, curated exhibits inside our temporary gallery. Um, and I chose this image because it helps me to define what is success. Here in Suquamish, from our perspective, when it came, I mean, the heart of the program is, is that storage room, preserving the collections. But as a museum for us, what is success is engaging tribal members and empowering them to share their own stories with their own families in their own voice. And that has been our most successful component within this space, be it workshops by led by tribal members, exhibits curated by tribal members, whatever it may be, being able to have the tribal community surrounding us own the space has been what has for us been the most successful component. And this exhibit, um, We Are the Ancestors, um, was followed up by another exhibit called Res Dogs, because inside this exhibit, We Are the Ancestors, somebody shared their dog, which accompanied them everywhere they went. And every, once everybody said that, it, you know, the thought was, oh, I didn't know we could share dog pictures. And so that the very next one followed this up with the same kind of thing. They wanted another exhibit. Um, and being amenable, being open to that, we literally postponed another exhibit we had planned on in order to accommodate that exhibit instead. So that's what I mean about the amount of, of voice and empowerment we try to give to the community in order to, to service their needs.
All right, now um, I'm just a couple of slides away from stopping talking, um, but I wanted to give you some of the behind the scenes, um, you know, the basic, the boring stuff, the numbers. And of course, whenever you build a new museum, if you're building from the ground up with no previous museum program, you're going to have a different journey than what we had. Um, because as I said, there was nearly 30 years of museum history before we opened this facility. But just to give an idea of what happened over that transition, in 2011, which was the last um, complete year in the old facility, the budget was $250,000. These are all ballparks there. Um, I just narrowed everything down. Not narrowed, but you know what I mean. Of that personnel was 175,000. The first year we were in this building, the budget was 475,000 and personnel was 330,000. So that's sort of a snapshot of the immediate growth. And remember back to that number where um, the business plan always thought we would never exceed $400,000. Well, by the time we got to 2019, our budget is about $630,000 and personnel is about 400,000 of that. So that's one of our key lessons learned in this facility is that the people that are staff end up being your primary investment in the facility. Now, as I said, our nine staff, full, five are full-time and four are part-time. So this is not nine full-time staff in those numbers either. Um, I built out this chart just to give an idea of all the things that a museum does inside its doors. And we have a board of directors um, who has a board staff liaison, and then there's me. Then we have visitor services, we have education, we have collections we do development, and then we have operations. Now with nine people, five full-time, four part-time, we could not possibly do all that this chart represents every single year. It, it's just, it's impossible and we've tried a few years. Um, but we survive by intentionally and ruthlessly prioritizing. So even if you build a museum of modest size as we have, even if your staff, your investment cannot go as high as you wish it could go, you can still do a, a successful program by just being truly intentional, by listening to the community, and then by just being really ruthless in how you prioritize things. And the other thing that, of course, saves us is that we rely on the partners among other tribal departments. We have the youth center, we have a, um, Chief Kitsap Academy, which is the school. We have the language program. We have um, uh, the traditional plants program. There are so many programs that we take advantage of in partnership where what we want to do mirrors what they want to do. So, but this was one of those tales here in Suquamish that was a little bit hard to swallow. Um, most people after that business plan thought that as a tourist destination, the museum would grow to support itself through earned income. And I've never known a museum where I've worked that that has been true. And I now know after nearly 10 years in, it's never gonna be true of this museum. We do have a lot of earned income, as I said in the beginning, about 180,000 but 180,000 of a $630,000 budget doesn't even pay for the personnel. So you do have to be realistic when it comes to how fast your budget will grow. And last slide. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of share that's unique to Suquamish is how we manage our governance. Uh, this is, I also listed out what those um, tribal positions or what the museum positions were. Uh, and I, this is one of our positions. It's literally legal. The title of his job description is visitor services representative, custodian, researcher. It's part of how we also work around here is that almost every single one of these jobs, they may be one thing, but they're doing two to three other things too. So that's the other way we survive. We are a staff that are jack of all trades. And what we don't know, we learn. So that's another way that we've been able to really thrive in this space within the resources that we have available. 
But when it comes to governance, we are chartered by the um, Suquamish tribe within the, um, you know, the government regulations. Um, and it lays out our governance board and how that board's relationship is to um, the tribe as a whole, the parent organization. Our board of trustees are seven members. It includes a member of tribal council, which right now is the chair, Leonard Forsman, a member of the Suquamish Foundation Board, and a member, a representative member from Port Madison Enterprises, which is the economic business arm of the Suquamish tribe. Um, they are charged with hiring and supervising my, my position. So, oh gosh, I'm sorry, if I do that, I guess I won't have one more time to do that. Um, they review and adopt policy and they provide direction for goals and objectives. Now the Suquamish Museum is an independent 501c3 organization and we're also a Suquamish tribal department. And our general relationship between those two gets kind of muddy um, and we just kind of keep going. So I don't have an independent finance department or an HR department, that's the tribes. But when I go out to ask for a grant or a foundation ask, I generally use my 501c3. So it's been sort of a balancing act between being independent and yet also part of the larger tribal administration culture. <clears throat> and it surprisingly works, partly because everybody who is associated with the Museum of Suquamish has one goal and that is for us to be successful. That gets us over a lot of homes. All right, and last slide is I couldn't end. Um, having the Suquamish Ferry named Suquamish was one of the celebratory moments of my time here. Um, and so I, I had to have a, a view of it. Just, you know, the paper wasn't even off the windows yet. And this is its maiden voyage with the uh, Seattle Space Needle in the background. So very proud of this moment. Um, but that is the end of the formal presentation. And oh, and I will just say that in order to, I want to recognize some of our, our people in the room that I saw come, um, a lot of staff members, but since I cannot see everybody, I will tell you, I know I have Joanna Sharphead, who was our sales and marketing. She does uh, both the store and our marketing. Uh, we have Angie Harrington, who is a collections management specialist. Ashley Weller, who is our education person. I saw Gus come into the room earlier. He's our tour, he's the guy with the three titles, but he does a little bit of everything, I tell you, and we would be lost without him. I see a board member, Della Crowell, um, who is also our elders. Um, program advisor. And if I'm missing anybody, please hold up your hand at some point. And I am open for questions. So Janet, um, this is Daniel. Hi. I, <laughs> you, as you know, we're working on the Crow Culture Center and then the Squally Culture Center. Both of these are more focused on cultural center uh, activity versus a museum. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping you could talk about how does this either the museum itself function that way or is it the House of Awakened Culture that kind of as a is a paired with this as another facility that where the cultural activities occur. Is that kind of how it works? Uh, yes and both. Um, it a lot of it depends on the size of the crowd. Um, our education room, which is where we tend to gather for workshops, presentations, et cetera, seats 49 people. Um, we up to literally 80 people in there. Um, but as a size, it's for smaller groups and workshops. But a tribal celebration, if that's happening, song and dance, so many things, that's happening down in the way, the house of waking culture. One more educational programming. So when you were working on, or the tribe was working on, on this at the beginning, was it always kind of seen that way that it's sort of twin, two twin structures, one doing more of the cultural focus, one the preserving 
celebration focus? The Suquamish Museum itself had not been a um, facility whereby a lot of cultural expression had happened in the past, you know, in the broad community sense. Um, they had always had workshops within the space. But a lot of it too was again size. So when I said, you know, Suquamish intentionally built the size of facility they could pay for. Um, since we have occupied this building almost within the first year, we started dreaming about um, an annex. So you know, utilizing that space to turn the building in, an, in the opposite direction and build a, um, a floor that housed education and a theater and then had a cafe adjacent, have um, offices, have storage in it and then turn this building in its entirety into exhibit space. So, you know, from the get-go, we started dreaming that we could become that cultural space. But I, I have a feeling it's a little bit farther down the road still. So is there any kind of administrative relationship with the House of Awakened Culture, or is it there are two really independent structures and activities? completely different and independent. Um, and the house of awakening culture isn't so much a facility as it is a building. So you literally reserve it or rent it, depending oh, on- Oh, I you. see, I got you. So the reason I'm asking is, you, as you know, with, with like Crow, we're thinking of two, potentially two separate facilities. One that would be more like the museum visitor center functioned by the battlefield and one that would be the cultural activities focus on the campus at Little Bighorn. So if that were to occur, would it, you know, I, it sounds almost like it's just two separate things, like, or is it possible to run them as a kind of a joint operation if they're That's separate? Possible. I think joint is possible. I mean, a lot of museums even today have the museum building that houses 80 to 90% of its functions. And then they might have an offsite that houses the 10 to 20% more, um, be that collection storage or event programming. Right, so but your that, preference would be to actually expand what you have right on the site and have classrooms and cultural things right with you. Right, only because it makes sense here. I mean, somewhere else it might make sense to separate them by miles or neighborhoods or, or whatever. It mm. all goes to that question of why and how. Well, except it's a staffing thing too. Like you're saying, there's only so much, you know, it, it takes a lot to, to manage and support these things. So having those there would, you wouldn't have to duplicate all that at another site. Right. But I do know, even if we follow the dream that, that we build an adjacent facility, that I can guarantee you is gonna double or more than double our budget. And it is going to mean and a significant increase in our personnel budget. I mean, I always, all my career, you know, early on in Utah, I learned that building the building is the easy part. As hard as it seems when you first get started, building a museum is simple. It's the operation ever after, that's the hard part. Um, so that's the kind of thing where you shouldn't build too much too soon, start small. Um, yeah. Oh, Daniel, that's no wisdom new to you. <laughs> Thank you. This is great, great insights. Okay, what other questions do we have? Any other questions? There's some in the uh, chat, Melissa. Um, I actually can't see them, Susan, because my- oh, oh, you can't? Okay. No, there was one, I, I think it's been answered, but- No, there was a question about your food service. Ah, good question. We, when we opened our store, um, our museum store at the front of the building, I had always known that if you give some visitors something to drink, they'll stay longer. And so we tried to open kind of a mini um, coffee bar inside the store space. And I think in the first six months, we sold four cups of coffee. Um, it, it just didn't work. 
So after trying a, a variety of ways to entice people to stay with us and eat, um, we gave it up about the second, beginning of the third year in. And our problem wasn't that they didn't want to eat or drink something or even buy it from us. It was the fact that we had no place where they could sit down and enjoy it. Um, let's see if I can get back to that lobby picture. Right here, that's our lobby. So the store is sort of right here in the back corner. And the front looks like the back, a window wall. And so what we had were two chairs like this back here against the back window wall. And people just didn't feel comfortable sitting down and eating in front of the staff member who was at this desk. So if you're, if you're gonna incorporate food, you have to build in a dedicated visitor services location for them to consume the food comfortably. And then of course be capable of taking care of all the, all the trash and such they leave behind. All right, that's good. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, does the gift shop have potential for good income if you were able to expand it? Our gift shop is the saving grace in so many ways of this museum, um, but partly because of government accounting. So we have an expense side of the budget and we have an income side of the budget. The two do not know one another. So we have a product buying budget of 66,000 and we routinely, routinely now bring in $120,000. And from the tribe's perspective, we have $120,000 worth of profit income, not 120,000 minus 66,000. See what I mean? nor are we taking into account the staff who operated or the real estate or the lights, you know, the retail environment, so to speak. So it works for us as an in, the single most significant income generator. And then we've been very fortunate in our museum management, the uh, people assigned to, to make the most of that space. Right now that's Joanna Sharkett. Um, and the space is sort of a, it's mission driven in the sense that we devote part of that real estate to tribal artists. And Suquamish tribal artists, Port Gamble Squalum, who's a neighboring tribe, other tribal members who, who come to see us and have art within or product within the store, we take a minimum amount of markup on their pieces, maybe sometimes 10% or less. Um, the higher the item retail value is, the more we tend to make on it. Um, but if they're selling cedar roses for a dollar a piece, um, they're, they're selling them to us for a dollar, we're charging a dollar fifty. So we intentionally made the retail space a, an adjacent space for tribal artists in order to promote their work. Now then we also pack in a lot of retail goods from companies like Native Northwest um, and Eighth Generation, who is a company in Seattle that specializes in and wool blankets and other art designs. So it is very successful for us, but under very specific conditions. Stores are not always worth their real estate. Um, you have to really judge your conditions there. And Diana, didn't Suquamish buy eighth generation? No, that's not us. Um, I want to say so. Or Muckleshoot. Still call or, me. Oh, still call me, that's right, okay. Bye. Yeah, and we were the first retail outlet outside 8th Gen's um, flagship store in Pike Place Market and uh, um, established that relationship. And it has been an incredible um, component of the store's profit in these last few years. Wow, that's great. All right, looks like we have another question in the chat. Um, do you have a digital museum running in parallel with your physical museum? Not yet. Um, I say that only because I've challenged the staff in this pandemic to, to learn how to produce virtual content. Um, we have never gone that direction before, only because with our nine staff members, remember my, you know, my thought to being intentional and ruthless and what you prioritize, there was never time or budget for that before. But now with the pandemic, when our only option really in connecting with our audience is virtual, um, we've, we've switched directions and are beginning to go that way. And whatever the staff learns during this process, 
will then pay dividends, not just immediately as we join the virtual world, but downstream as well, as well because it will then be a learned tool in their, in their toolbox. Um, and I've, you know, I've, my staff here, um, they are excellent, dedicated, you know, people who enjoy learning and who are really bringing their skills to play in order for us to be successful. I can't say enough at how important it is from, you know, what you consider, I mean, in every workplace has a, a ladder, an employment ladder. Um, when, you, when you look at this workplace, our visitor service representatives who sits at that lobby desk for the most part, also is fluent in Lushootsie. So as a language specialist, she's invaluable to us in addition to her service as a BSR. Um, you know, and someone else might have an equal coast skill that so their job may not be high in the, the museum personnel paradigm, but their skills that they bring as tribal members or as individuals um, speak volumes and how valuable they are then to the, the program. So when you're hiring staff, you know, we focus, we get preference to tribal members. Um, hire them not so much for the job they're going to do because anybody can be trained. Hire them for who they are and what they can bring to your programs. And that way you're always paying double and triple duty on, on your staff, on those dollars. Did you say hire them for what they are or who they are? No, who they are, what they bring to the table in skill sets. Jenna, can, you talk, can you talk a little bit about the cost of, of heating and cooling the building? Oh yeah, that um, that goes up to one of my lessons learned. Um, the HVAC system that was designed into this building was not what it should be from the get-go. Within a year of occupying this building, we, we were experiencing trouble. Um, in 2014, literally just two years after we opened the facility, we did a fix. So we, you know, some of the original contractors came back and we did a fix. And this year, 2019, 2020, we have done a retrofit that's almost a quarter million dollars. Um, and part of that, of course, has been because in a museum environment, what's the most important thing to control is humidity. You know, if you can control temperature, you control humidity. If you control humidity, you're controlling the temperature. And for whatever reason, the system that they designed into this building did not have a fine enough transition mode. So it could not change from heating to cooling fast enough to maintain the constant humidity and temperature that we required. And we have been fiddling with it ever since. So the heating and cooling bill right now um, is more than ever anticipated in the space. They had anticipated having an electrical bill of somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 a month. And it has been consistently double that, if not a little more, because instead of using a um, chiller or a heat pump, we use two electric boilers to heat the space. So I, it is the single largest lesson learned here in Suquamish is when it comes to a museum design, the building of course is important, storage is important, but at the end of the day, what maintains the environment is, is the critical component. And, and Jana, why didn't you install a heat pump instead of a furnace? We have one, um, but its problem was is it couldn't change from, it was supposed to be able to change from cooling to heating yeah. within an hour's notice. And it took 24 hours practically to do that. So now the retrofit, when you look at our outside this mechanical room, you see the original, which is now dedicated to heating, and a new one that's dedicated to chilling or cooling water. Um, and it was a cost savings of a sense in the beginning to have one that could do double duty, right? Um, but that's how work, that, yeah. it's not saved any money in the long run. Huh. You, who was your HVAC engineer? Cunningham Engineering out of Seattle. And this is not a, any shade on that program. I mean, they didn't do it because they were trying to cut pennies 
on an engineering perspective. Um, there were a lot of decisions that went into the pot that ended up, you know, installing what we had. They at Cunningham as a firm, it was wonderful and is wonderful to work with. Okay, what other questions do we have? I've got a couple questions. Um, Janet, you said something like, I don't know if my note is quite accurate. Let the community have ongoing input, maybe even some direction or control. I don't think you put it exactly that way, but could you talk a little more about that? We have, um, we try to be responsive, 100% responsive. So of course we have a plan, but if a tribal member walks through the door and say, we really want to do this. You know, my family wants to do this or, or, or my group of friends want to do this. Then we have no hesitation in taking our plans and setting them aside or putting them into the future and changing gears and doing that. Only in the sense that if a tribal member or a tribal family walk in and ask us that, it's important to them. And at the end of the day, the facility, the museum, what we do here, is for tribal members. So, and in the end of the day, it's never sent us in a, down a bad hole. You know what I mean? It, we always end up better by following that side direction. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of another concrete example. I've had, I think the most important one was the Raz Dogs. The, you know, we had the one curated exhibit and immediately bled into another curated exhibit. Right now here in the pandemic, in our temporary gallery, we have um, wood carving by a Port Gamble um, small tribal member. And it started in December of 2018, you know, and, and now we've gone through all this pandemic and it was supposed to have ended in the summertime, but we just left it here and we're not closing it until March because all the Port Gamble tribal, um, Port Gamble Scotland tribal members who wanted to see that exhibit haven't had an opportunity. So rather than dismantling it while we've been shut down and installing the next one to open with that we had planned, we've just extended time. Um, and we're almost always trying to accommodate that kind of a question. But it's also a workshop thing. If I get a workshop person comes and says, I can only do it this weekend and we have another one planned that month. We take the one we have planned that month, work with them to do a different date and give it to the person who needs that month. So we try to be as open and as versatile as we can be. Okay, one other question I had was, you talked about after the museum opened, you got a flood of donated materials from other museums as well as community members we would anticipate some of that as well. But the materials that came from other museums, was that because of NAGPRA related uh, things or tell me how that worked? It was a variety. Um, Suquamish, as I said, uh, in a 30 year program, they had a very tiny space for collection storage. And so with the archeological collections, they're only, um, recourse was to put those on deposits in other museums. So that was a relationship when we built a facility large enough to handle it all, all of those deposits came home. And then in addition to that, there were a couple of um, collections, um, well, one in particular at the Burke Museum that had initially been meant to come to Suquamish, but for one reason or another in the 1930s, ended up going to the Burke Museum instead. And we, those the descendants of that family worked with the tribal, um, with the museum in order to convince the BERT to deaccession it from the state's collection and transfer it to Suquamish. Mm. So there were a wide variety of circumstances. Some we knew about and others we didn't anticipate. Thank you. This has been an amazing presentation and I think it might be a lot closer to our situation than, you know, while it was great, a, a big operation like Shakopee. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, definite museum envy throughout these presentations. Um, we're a very small site, <laughs> um, but oh gosh, those larger museums, how fun would that be? Well, like I was saying though, Tim, uh, my, my, the negative for me on Shakopee is when you get to that scale, it's really hard to create the kind of intimacy and that something like this has. I mean, just the space, the materials, everything I've been in this museum it has a, it gives a warm, friendly feeling. I think those big one, big institutions start to feel like giant institutions or kind of corporate. I think they lose some of the the beauty of of that uh, scale that 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 something like this achieves. So I I don't see it as all great to be giant. <laughs> no. I think I think it, I think a smaller, more intimate space is also more it. I, I think ultimately it's better for for reflects the 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 character of the tribes that we're working with. I think yes. part of that too, you know, just to add on there, even a small space like ours can seem very institutional. It all comes down to people at the end of the day. Mm. Um, and I I know I have been fortunate here and that the staff that have been here over time are have just always, you know, my my number one thing in hiring a staff member is that if you work in a museum, it has to be your passion. It's not a job. You really want to have to work in a museum and you've got to love what you do. Um, and if you can find those people who can rise to that challenge, any, you know, every institution that has that ability to be um, truly warm and inviting and intimate, even in the largest spaces. But it's a hard, it's a hard thing to fill, you know? Um, museums are not known for the high dollar amounts that they pay their staff, even contrary to my budget numbers there, our people are not overpaid. Um, they do a lot of work for what um, their job description says. And at the end of the day, it really is their passion to make the place shine that, that makes us successful. So it's, you know, it's, it's a soup. There are a lot of ingredients to a good soup. Um, there's facility, there's HVAC, but there's also people. And no one component is more important than another component at the end of the day. All right, so any other questions? Janet, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. I learned so much and um, I'm gonna talk to you about getting some of the documents um, so that we can put on our website because you have some really interesting things that I think the cohort would learn a lot from. Um, and if there's no other questions, I guess we will see everyone um, next week. If you signed up for the indigenous um, food webinar, then that is next Thursday. If not, we do not have a webinar next Wednesday. Thanks, Melissa. All Thanks. Right. Thank All right. So Thank you so much, Dan. All right. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all.